Our next speaker, Al Gillen, uh, I've known for a very long time and has also been sort of on a journey with us in open source from uh, his view at IDC as a research analyst. Uh, he oversees uh, their, uh, the open source uh, research portfolio amongst a, a variety of other areas. Please welcome Al Gillen. Thanks, Jim. I, I will say that I have never had to follow a presentation like that. So. And I, I also will say I'm not funny. So now that we've all gotten a lot of laughs out of our system, I'm not going to help with that at all. <laughs> so a couple things that, that Dan brought up that really made me stop and think. One is that I've actually been at IDC. I'm in my 18th year, which is uh, stunning. It's unusual in the industry at this point. And I don't know, maybe uh, I'm also uh, 58 years old. So maybe I'm, I'm part of the old guard and not part of what's going to be in the future. So the other thing I thought was really interesting was he talked about you know, the, uh, the community and how there are different buying factions and so forth. When I think back to where I was at IDC in the beginning of my career in the early 2000s, it was, and I'll talk a lot about because I've got some historical slides that are actually going to tie in nicely to what Dan uh, talked us through. But I actually had uh, people that loved me and people that hated me. And uh, you know, it was just interesting because I, what, we, what we tend to believe at, at IDC as an analyst if everybody loves you, you know, you may be not doing the right thing. And if everybody hates you, you're probably not doing the right thing. But if some people like you at certain points of time and they hate you at other points of time and vice versa, you must be doing something right. So there was a, when I started my career, I had a, uh, a large software company that is now a member of the Linux Foundation of all places, hated my Linux data. And then I had somebody in the open source community that had a hate page for me. So I guess I was doing the right thing. So anyway, what I want to talk about today, uh, there's a few things. I want to take a little bit of a, a walk back into the past. And this is a little bit of a deja vu for me to be here today, because I've actually presented to uh, a couple of Linux Foundation events in the past. And I wanna, I'm actually going to pull up a couple slides that show data that I presented when I was here back in 2008. And I think it's interesting, because some of the messages that I saw there and some of the learnings that we, we pulled out of our data at that point in time is going to be reflected in what we see going forward from this, this point here. And then I also want to talk about uh, to kind of roll that forward and tell you what we see as where open source fits in the industry going forward. And uh, frankly, I'm really very lucky to have been in this position at IDC to watch the evolution of open source software for all these years. Because from my point of view, it really it is the future. The future is all about open source. And we see very much open source becoming the standardization layer that enables everything else that we do in the industry. So I got my 20 minutes. I better start going. So let me set the stage here. So if we look back to 2001, I mean, you could read those bullet points. I mean, George Bush had just been uh, sworn in. Wikipedia had just spun up. Uh, Mac OS X, Windows XP, and so forth were products that were just coming to market. Wow, it's a long time ago. Doesn't that seem crazy? So uh, Linux was, was in the market at that point, And that's when we were seeing Linux really emerging as a solution for commercial implementations. And we saw people actually putting Linux in place where they previously most often had been using Unix at that point in time. And part of it was a re result of the, uh, uh, the dot-com bust, right? We had huge slashes to budgets that, that uh, corporations put on their IT departments in particular. And people still had to stand up services. They had to put up web servers and uh, uh, transactional servers and so forth. And Linux turned out to be the, the low or no cost solution that they used to do that. So it's pretty interesting how that, that really got us traction. So this is some data that we presented back then. And the thing that I think is really fascinating, so all the way at the top, price, right? Linux is quote unquote free. So uh, that was one of the real attractions. But the reliability was something that, that really jumped out at that point in time. So those are the sort of things where we look at that and we say, yeah, that was really foretelling of where this was going. But there's a couple of other things. And one that I'd like to, to point out, which really actually frightened us, if you will. Down here, uh, about halfway down, there's one that says, believe in Linux. So we kind of like to, to think of that as, if you will, the, the zealotry. And back then, there were a lot of people who just loved open source and used open source software because they believed in it. It's not because it necessarily was better or solved the problem, but they just had this belief that it was the right solution. And I would argue that that moment in time, you know, that's OK, but, but long term, Open source software has to be something more than you believe in. It has to really deliver value. And it has, has done that. It really certainly has over time. So some of the challenges that people faced at that point in time. So at the top, so lack of in-house skills. Let that one sink in for just a second. I think that that continues to be the number one problem that many organizations have for adopting whatever the most exciting and current open source initiatives might be. So whether it's uh, 
hypervisor technology that came along or whether it's uh, container technology that's emerging today and, and orchestration, Kubernetes and Mesos and so forth, people say, you know, we don't have the skills. We, you know, they're looking for skills to, to support these kinds of environments. It's always the challenge that the open source community faces is you bring these great things forward, then there's, this, there's a skills shortage and people need to learn how to use these things. So uh, in any event, it's pretty interesting. You know, we look at that and I look at it today and, and frankly, some of the challenges really remain the same. Okay, so let's zoom forward to 2008. This is when I was last presenting at the Linux Foundation at one of these events. Um, so the iPhone had just come onto the market. Seems like we've had iPhones for a really long time. Uh, oil was $100 a barrel, and by the way, the stock market was again on its way down to a, a new low point, and we had these, what, 777 point in drop in, Feb in, in September of 2008. So Bill Gates was about to step down. Uh, Fidel Castro was about to resign and so forth. So really, you know, we're at a point in the industry where things were changing. And when we looked at the data, we, we collected this data of what was happening in the Linux market overall. We started to apply year over year comparisons to look at what was happening. And the thing that's fascinating is if you look at this slide, the stuff on the right tends to be very infrastructure oriented, right? And Linux really got its start in the infrastructure side of the market. So web servers, print and file servers, DNS, DHCP, security, email scrubbers, things like that. But the things that, that were really very business oriented, so the line of business applications, the uh, CRM and data warehousing and things like that tended to be the areas that, that the proprietary operating systems held their grip on much longer. But we saw this shift happening in 2008 where the market was starting to tilt and Linux had become credible and a reasonable alternative for those types of workloads, which really set the stage for where we are today. So one of the other things I think was really fascinating is look at this. So again, back to that zealot request, that point I'd made earlier, look at, look at the yellow bars at the bottom here. This is the, the, the portion of the readers or the portion of the people that we surveyed that told us that Linux was a top-down initiative driven by management. It basically doubled from 2002 to 2006. So there's the credibility being established, and frankly, I'd argue that it was so important for Linux to establish this level of credibility because Linux becomes the foundation for just about everything else we do with open source software going forward. So as a result, if it's got this kind of credibility, we've got this top down, this top -down acceptance, the barriers for absorbing and, and, and uh, consuming and deploying new open source technologies becomes much, much lower going forward. Okay, so uh, here we are today. I'll do one more of these charts since I've done the, the historical one. So here's where we're at today. We've got another new president. The stock market for change is not on its way down, at least at the moment. Uh, interesting thing, I mean, the notion of online content and internet and, and, and social networking and so forth has become very ubiquitous, and we've got this, this availability of information. In fact, we've got too much information, and not, half the time we can't even tell what's real and what's not real. But there's another really interesting, and frankly, I'd argue, a little bit of a scary transition happening in the industry right now, and that's that the proprietary software products, the vendors that have made their business for a long, long time selling software and software only, are finding that it's becoming more and more difficult to be a software vendor. And that's partly because of open source software, the, the tide continues to, ride, to rise, and these, uh, these proprietary products that have been the bread and butter for a lot of software companies for a long time are having a harder and harder time differentiating. And the other thing is, a lot of these things are turning into services that are being delivered through the, the cloud vendors. So whether it's Google or whether it's Amazon or Microsoft Azure or, or the second tier level of, of service providers, these types of things are now becoming services. You don't necessarily have to go buy an operating system. You can rent one from a vendor like that. So it just changes the dynamics of the industry. Other things, so, so Amazon and VMware, I mean, who would have thought that they would get into an alignment, but, but really that becomes the on-ramp for VMware to bring their customers into a real robust worldwide cloud, and for, for Amazon, it becomes a conduit for them to pull Windows installations over their, <clears throat> over their cloud. And of course, Microsoft uh, joining the Linux Foundation, good for them, I mean, I think they should have, uh, with Satya Nadella at the helm now for three years, it's a different company, and I think if Satya hadn't, hadn't been named CEO, I don't know if Microsoft would even be relevant going forward, but they, they've certainly turned the corner there. So pretty interesting stuff. And what's happened overall? This is a map of where the Linux, Linux market has gone. The red and the yellow lines are Linux. The yellow is the non-paid non Linux, so the, the non-commercial distributions. <clears throat> and this would include the versions of Linux that are stood up as the base OS in cloud infrastructure. So every time Amazon or Google spins up a new server, that's part of that yellow line. So naturally, you're seeing a lot of growth because of the cloud build out. But the red piece, uh, you know, the, the commercial side, so that's the Red Hats and the, the SUSAs and the Ubuntus that are under commercial support that customers are deploying. So continued growth on there, and that's a lot of that 
over time moves over into virtualized instances. They're not necessarily physical server instances. It's more about, there's more growth in the virtual side of the market, and that's the way it's going to be going forward. So again, really interesting transition there that's taking place. So a couple of things I'd like to talk in, you know, about how this, this uh, transition, where it's coming from and where it goes from here. So we think about you know, what, what's happening in the industry. So all these, you see the, You've seen some of the symptoms in my, uh, my previous slides or the, you know, the, 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 the visible elements of change. And it's being driven by a number of things. And one is that we've gone to standardization. This has been happening arguably for close to 20 years. We standardized at the hardware layer where x86 servers become the predominant server. We've standardized at the OS layer and it used to be Windows and Linux and I'd argue that going forward it's really Linux as the primary OS on the x86 platform. Windows continues to exist and more so as a guest going forward than as the base OS because most of the stuff spun up in cloud, again, are going to be basically Linux servers. But what's fascinating is above the OS layer we're getting a lot of standardization. I got another slide where I'll talk to that in a little bit more depth. So interconnection of systems, yeah, we've got local area networks in our environments and all of our servers are connected already, but our processes are not connected. And today, we see this big transition in the industry where, um, where this, this sense of digital transformation is taking place and people are trying to automate and bring massive amounts of data into their world so they can make decisions on the fly based on data and respond to that data uh, using this, this interconnection of systems. And, and by the way, that means that there's an awful lot of new software that has to be written. So intellectual property used to be about uh, a server design or about a, uh, a piece of software where you've got it heavy, heavily protected through patents and so forth. Today, that, that may still be the case here, but the interesting thing is it's no longer emerging in the industry as an application that you go and buy a box of software or a license for a piece of software that you're going to consume. It's more so emerging as part of the systems that we, we get. So what I'm talking about is, it's a, it's a car, right? It's a Tesla with a lot of software in it. It's an airplane that has an instrumented engine. Things like that where the software becomes part of the intellectual property that makes things better. So really, going forward, you know, we see the, the evidence that there's just an enormous amount of hiring going on at companies that traditionally are not software companies, but rather are manufacturing companies because they want to have this software intellectual property built into their systems. And data. There's just data uh, that's coming from everywhere. So social data, mobile data, IoT data, and so forth. I was doing a presentation in, um, I guess it was December, I think, and I was actually in front of a crowd. It was heavily dominated by Wall Street types. And I, you know, I just thought, you know, boy, for those guys, they suddenly have a world where when our president makes a tweet, it changes the, 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 changes the nature of the stock market, and suddenly that has to be an input to their trading systems. So you start to think about how data can change your business. There's a really very good example. But I mean, it's, it's not just simply that. It's about, so IoT data, we've got weather data, we've got uh, uh, consumer behavior data. All this stuff influences how you sell your products going forward. And finally, all this is act, the action end of this is the, the, the ability to do decision support and real-time analytics on these data sources. So all these things become part of what is driving our industry going forward. And the key point there is that all of this comes back to the fact that we have to write new software that can allow us to do all these things. Okay, so um, this slide really is just a, it's a summary slide of a number of different things, but, but the nature of what we're looking at is when we think about the transformation, so there's what we refer to at IDC as accelerators, so things like uh, security, augmented and virtual reality, uh, Internet of Things, cognitive AI, and so forth. These are all drivers that they force this acceleration to go. And across the top, those icons, those are icons that represent some of the industry clouds we expect to see emerge. So, for example, uh, healthcare, retail, uh, manufacturing, energy, government, and uh, um, financial. So those are all areas where we see a great deal of interest in developing verticalized cloud resources for these industries that are going to drive the consumption of software. And by the way, a lot of that is enabled by open source. So going forward to be competitive, you've got to embrace the standardized infrastructure, modernize applications, and a lot of this ties right into a modern DevOps type deployment model. And uh, again, that standardization allows you to be iterative, it allows you to be responsive, and it allows you to disrupt your competitors. So um, just a few thoughts here. So I talked a little bit about the application end of it. I really see applications, modern applications, so cloud-native applications, as becoming the thing that really drives us forward and allows, allows all these new capabilities to be uh, delivered and to be consumable by both the developer community and by the end user, organ end user community out there. So um, th the thing to remember, though, is that the installed applications, so if you've got applications that were written, I don't care if they were first platform applications as we refer to it at EC, so mainframe applications, or if they're second platform distributed computing applications on Linux, Unix, Windows, 
Those applications don't go away. They still have business value, but they're not going to make this shift and become a, a modern cloud native application. So what you're going to do is you're going to wind up building new applications that sit alongside of them and sit on top of them and leverage those old applications for the business intelligence that they have, but, but they're not going to be modern. They're not going to be replaced. What we do see is we expect to see a lot of it. What we refer to as lift and shift, where these applications are going to be rolled up into a container and, and re-hosted somewhere else, but they're going to be continued to be used essentially as is for a long time to come. The starting points and the endpoints, I mean, they're pretty clear. If it's a Windows app, it stays on Windows. If it's a Linux app, it stays on Linux. We don't see a lot of movement back and forth across, across things like that for, for the very reason that there's no real business value associated with doing a migration. And finally, the cloud native apps become, it really becomes the entry point for this new batter, battleground. And we see pretty much every vendor in the industry, if they're going to be relevant for the next 10 years, they need to have a cloud native strategy. They have to have a way of building the life cycle for these applications. They have to make sure that they can prevent, present opportunities for these applications to be successful. So um, let's see, uh, customers, I mean, the, when we talk to customers, they very much see this as being their future. They want to be doing cloud native applications. They, they very much are trying to get into the space. They find that there are barriers because they don't necessarily have the skills that they need. Um, but they, they very much see this as where they want to go. But the thing that's interesting for me is that in many cases, the applications they have don't necessarily need to be cloud-native applications, meaning does it need to have internet scale? Right? If you've got an ERP system where you've got you know, 1,000 users or 5,000 users or 10,000 users, that doesn't go from 10,000 users to a million users overnight. Right? You've got an enterprise of a, a fixed number of employees. So those kinds of abilities to scale up and scale down in a very responsive manner, that's not necessarily one of the requirements that you have to fulfill in a, in a typical enterprise. Standardization, we talked about that. It's very much a precursor for, for modern cloud applications. And finally, the applications. Um, one of the things I think is really fascinating, as, a, as a, you know, the guy that followed operating systems at IDC for, for a long time and began my career as a programmer, you know, we think of operating system APIs as really kind of being the holy grail of development, but that's not the case anymore. Really, anybody that's programming to operating system APIs is really limiting the viability and the, the portability of their application going forward. So the notion of uh, you know, not writing to OS APIs and really using as much abstraction as you can, that's really where you have to go going forward. So um, this slide really just, you know, this is pretty stuff that you guys really understand because you are the people that have helped build all the things that make this possible. But we started with Linux, but we've now got this whole ecosystem where we've got infrastructure software, we've got the developer tools, we've got the middleware pieces, and the applications. We've really come full circle. And today it's the application piece that's really fascinating. We see a lot of activity going on there. And in many cases, I think that, that things that are going to fall into the application sphere are going to be things that are going to look and feel a lot more like services that are going to be delivered by a cloud vendor. So you're going to go to Google and you're going to consume TensorFlow services from them, right? That'll be a thing that will make your application better. And that's how the application piece really becomes a much smarter, more capable um, set, of, set of, of resources for developers. But it's amazing to me, again, when you think about this, we've come from pretty much from zero to what we have today. And obviously, uh, this is only a sprinkling of icons. There could be you know, three times that number of icons in here. This has all happened literally in the last 18 or 20 years. Okay, so just a couple data slides I think help here. So this is just a snapshot of some, some work we did around DevOps. My team did some research on uh, what the developers are, are looking for. And one of the things I thought was really fascinating here is that people that ranked open source software based products, so, so basically they want to use products that were built using open source software as the, um, the underlying component, that's the kind of products they want to consume. But they don't really want to use stuff which is, uh, they don't want to use it directly off of the, the community. So they don't want to use a community versus version. They want to go to a commercialized vendor and have that vendor deliver them a commercial product based on open source that they can use. And if there's a problem, they want to have a phone number or an email where they can say, help fix it. Right? And that's what the cloud vendors do as well. So if you go to Amazon and you're using some of their cloud services and there's a problem, you don't have to fix it. You have to tell them, we have a problem. This is what the problem is. And it's their, pro it's their job to fix it. That's the value prop that you get from having a commercializer associated with the open source software that you want to use. In terms of um, the, uh, the maturity, so uh, here we see people telling us that they're, they're finding it. They still are concerned about the, the, the level of maturity. And this is very specific to DevOps. So in the DevOps space, we think there's certainly room for there to be a fair amount of growth going forward. But the point is, again, that the, the users are telling us that we like open source software, we want, we want it to be commercially supported. 
and we're concerned that they're not mature enough and, and broad enough for our needs. So again, it kind of gives the marching orders to the community that, that you need to continue driving forward in these projects. But, but remember, that commercial ecosystem, I think, is, is as essential to the long-term viability of open source software as the community that does the development is. So it's really a, it, it's a two-sided thing. And there's really value associated from having commercializers, uh, vendors that, that commercialize open source products and make them consumable for the masses. OK, so let me wrap up here. I think I've hit on all the points. So just to summarize, so we think that cloud native applications are very much a differentiator. We're not going to take our existing applications and make them cloud native, but we're going to write a lot of cloud native stuff that's going to sit alongside of our existing applications as going to consume the business value, the business value, the intelligence, the information, the data that's in those applications and make that usable for these modern cloud, cloud application uh, or cloud application uh, products that are being built. So the frameworks are continuing to change. Uh, frankly, I, I think that container technology and orchestration technology that's, that's very much sweeping across the industry today, I think it's wonderful. I think it's something that the industry has needed for a long time. I mean, we've talked about reusable code since when I was back in school, well into the, well back into the last century. And uh, you know, the notion of having reusable code segments that actually are truly portable, that's really great stuff. So cloud native apps, I mean, very much we're moving this model where we've got more and more platform independence, and that's wonderful. Platform independence means that that application can go where you want it to go, and you're not locked into an, any individual vendor, and I think that's a great thing. So there's evolution that has to happen, right? So we've got a lot of orchestration technologies in the market. We've got competing container designs in market. I think that we, you know, we've largely gotten through the container piece of it, but the orchestration end of it really hasn't sorted itself out, and I think that it has to. So over time, that will happen, and the open source community is great about having competing projects which ultimately uh, you know, find a, a common theme, and, and sooner or later, a, a, you know, a survivor emerges and becomes the predominant solution. So uh, development of containerized applications, it's a huge thing for your, the end customer. So for the commercial, I'm sorry, for the enterprises in the industry that are building applications for their businesses today. They're all working on containerizing. They want to put stuff in containers. And we talk to them today, we'll, we'll ask a large organization, organization, we'll say, are you using containers? And they say, yes. And we say, great, how, you know, how many of them have you stood up? And they say, gosh, at least a dozen. So, <laughs> which tells you that, you know, that they're so early in their adoption. In many cases, the things that they've stood up are these lift and shifts. So uh, I mentioned this previously, but just to underscore, existing applications don't get rebuilt they get re reused in terms of their value, but not in terms of being re rebuilt from the ground up. And finally, open source software is the foundation of modern applications. And uh, it's absolutely clear to me that that's, that's really where it's going to be going forward. Uh, training skills, that's, that's going to be a challenge. So that's it. Uh, wrap up my, my presentation. And thanks for the opportunity to present here. And I hope it's not another eight years before I'm up again. <laughs> All right. Hold on one second. Thanks, uh, so. You know, it's interesting because your data backs up our thesis, which is the, the, you know, the key we want to focus on are sustainable projects that have really good code, solving a big problem upstream, diverse, rich community, that then gets used to create value, whether it's for a service or a product, you know, what you're seeing, people wanting, right? They yeah. want vendor support and open source. And then some of that gets reinvested back into the community, and that's sustainability. So it was interesting to see that data. I really yeah. appreciate it. That's Thank great. you. Thanks, Jim.